Welcome back. Today I'm continuing the process to convert my 1981 DeLorean to an electric vehicle. In the last episode, I covered the process to find and purchase this 2019 Chevy Bolt, which is going to be the donor vehicle. And in this episode, I'm going to show you how we take this salvage vehicle and get it into running and driving condition so that we can confirm that all of the parts work before we swap them over into the DeLorean. To catch you up quickly, we're taking the entire drivetrain out of the Volt. The electric motor, the inverter, the charger, the batteries, everything, and moving them over to the DeLorean. This is Project Lightning. The first issue that I had to deal with upon arrival of the car was that there were no lights turning on, the dash wouldn't come on, and the car was just completely dead. Uh, this is very common for salvage vehicles. They sit on a lot somewhere and don't get turned on for a few months, and it completely drains the 12 volt battery. I used a multimeter and found that the battery had a voltage of three volts. That is a very, very dead battery. The tow truck driver used a portable jump start box and it lasted about five seconds before shutting off. It did turn the screen on for a second though. Uh, I tried a battery charger, but after a minute, I wasn't able to turn the car on still. Uh, so I grabbed a spare battery, tossed it on top and then connected it to the battery in the car and a charger in parallel. The car would then light up, the accessory lights worked and the dash turned on. I tried to get the car into service mode so I could shift into neutral, but nothing I tried worked. I kept getting an error saying the car couldn't communicate with the key fob, even though it was in the car. This was all going on while I'm trying to get the car unloaded from a tow truck, so after about five minutes of trying, I gave up, and the tow truck driver winched it off uh, with all of the wheels locked up, but then it was in my shop, and I put it on wheel dollies to move it around. Um, as you can see, the front end looks just great. Uh, you know, on the side here, I think there's a couple of scratches, um, you know, some stuff. Uh, and then, you know, on the back, I think most of this will buff out. Yeah, okay, this isn't gonna buff out, that's fine. Uh, so, so yeah, this, this car was in an incredibly serious car accident. As far as I can deduce, logically, um, is that it was not occupied at the time it was hit, I'm hoping. Um, and the reason I think that is because um, none of the airbags went off. So the car, um, like normally if you're in a collision, you know, like the kind of collision like this, um, it's going to completely blow every airbag in the car and none did literally none did. So, um, I'm hoping that means that it was not occupied just for their sake. Um, and then here on the back, the, you know, it's, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's incredibly serious damage to the back. But you know what's great about the Chevy Bolt? All of the important components are right here under the front of the car that sustained absolutely no damage. Um, so this is this little box that basically takes the, uh, the battery pack power and distributes it. I think it's called the battery distribution or the power distribution box or something like that. Um, under that, is uh, this box here, that is uh, the inverter. So that's the you know, motor controller. Over here is I think the 12 volt. Um, yeah, this is the 12 volt cable. So this basically takes the you know, 400-ish volts and converts it to 12 volts. Um, under that is the charger, the onboard charger module. And then below those things that you cannot see at all from the top here, uh, is the electric motor. Um, yeah, so I can't open this door. Ugh. Ugh. It's a little, little stuck. I bet some WD-40 would clear that right up. Uh, I haven't tried to open this door. Oops. Uh, yeah, uh, so if you look here in the back, you can see uh, yeah, there's pretty serious damage. Even the door is caved in over there. Um, and also, yeah, it might be hard to tell from the camera angle, but that whole seat is kind of bumped up and pushed up. Um, oh, well, this door is perfect. So there. Um, and then, okay, so if you're like me, the only important thing that I'm like, oh, I hope this isn't damaged, is the battery pack. Because the battery pack... Um, goes almost as far. And if you look right here, you can see 
uh, what I'm talking about here is this guy. That is the battery pack. And so just looking at it, you can tell that there's not much serious damage. There is some bent metal right there, uh, but that bent metal is most likely from the forklift uh, when they lifted the car out. And so those kinds of superficial scratches on there are totally fine by me for the conversion. Uh, in fact, the entire battery pack here is gonna be removed from the car and then completely disassembled. Uh, so I'm not even gonna keep it. But yeah, if you wanna do a little bit more close up inspection. So, um, <laughs> this, this is a hatchback. <laughs> this hatchback is supposed to be about here. So it's crushed in probably, uh, at least I would say two feet forward. Um, this here is, is the actual bumper. Um, this is the structural component, the bumper that, that goes across here. And as you can see, it's just completely sheared off. Um, there's a tail light there. Uh, I, I don't even know what this component is. Like they're so smashed in. Um, I can't even tell. Uh, this part is the floor of the like the back seat of the hatchback area. So behind the, the back seats, there's there's actually like a good storage area right there. Uh, and that's that's just completely gone. So, I mean, I guess lucky me that most of the damage is really, I mean, obviously it's in the back and I did that on purpose. Well, I didn't do the damage on purpose. I picked a car that had damage in the back on purpose because there's nothing back here that I need. I used a scan tool and pulled codes. It showed that there were 33 DTCs. Uh, those are diagnostic trouble codes. I quickly glanced at them, saw that most of them were like low voltage codes, uh, probably thrown while trying to get a good battery connection. And then I cleared them. When I rescanned again, it was down to nine. So that's great progress, but unfortunately the car still wouldn't start. I went on the Chevy Bolt forums and asked if anyone knew what conditions would prevent service mode. And I got a great suggestion to fix any airbags that had fired. Now, looking in the car, there were not any airbags that had popped, but in the DTC information, there were four error codes for the inflatable restraint sensing and diagnostic module saying that the seat pretensioners had gone off. This was a great suggestion. When a modern car is in an accident, in addition to airbags, the car also fires off two pyro charges in the seat belts. One of those is in the anchor point on the floor and it tensions the seat belt by a couple of inches and makes sure that it's tight across your chest. The other one is for the seat belt retractor, which causes it to lock up. It turns out that these had both fired on my car on the driver's side and passenger side. This is actually a little weird because neither seat belt was being used at the time of the accident. Um, you can tell because they're flush up against the side of the car. Uh, I'm pretty sure the car wasn't occupied, but they still went off. The fix for these codes should be to replace the seatbelt retractor and anchor or have them rebuilt. But the DeLorean doesn't have these. It's 40 years old and it doesn't have airbags. So instead I packed it. I used a 2.2 ohm resistor shoved into each of the connectors. Uh, this makes the sensor think I've replaced it and the error codes go away. The resistor fits really loosely in the connectors though, so I swapped it for some airbag simulators on eBay that are basically the same thing in a plastic box. After this, I did another DTC check and I was down to three codes, but still, I couldn't get into service mode. At this point, I only had one error code that I was getting that made sense, uh, which was a transponder authentication code. The issue with the key fob, I started debugging why the key fob wouldn't work. I went into the service manual and started looking up info on the electronics. And I found out that in the rear left C pillar of the car, there is a radio module that talks to the key fob. So if those wires were cut or damaged, the key fob wouldn't work. Um, I spent a few hours opening up the back end of the car, removing the car seat, removing all the smashed in metal to get access to the C pillar because I pretty much didn't have a C pillar. Uh, I tried a bunch of tools, but the one that actually worked best was the air chisel. This is the same thing as an air hammer, except it's a different bit on the end. It has kind of a V shape and it slices pretty easily through sheet metal, so long as you can get a decent angle on it. Uh, it's fast, it's pretty safe around wiring and stuff because it doesn't go very deep, and it also doesn't create any dust or sparks. The car was really badly smashed up in this area, uh, but I did open it up enough to find that there was a pinched bundle of cables leading to that radio module. 
and some of those wires were cut. I really thought that this would solve the problem, so I repaired the wires and tested the system by following the manual, and it was working. Uh, but it still didn't solve the key missing message, and I still couldn't get it into service mode. At this point, I was trying everything I could think of to fix the key. I went through every fuse in both of the fuse boxes, and they were all good. I opened up the key fob, I cleaned out the contacts, replaced the battery, and that didn't help. Uh, then I thought maybe I could try to reprogram the key. Uh, maybe it had been sitting for so long the memory had corrupted or something like that. Uh, so I tried using the scan tool to start the process, and I just had terrible luck. I spent hours trying to get it to reprogram the keys. The issue was that I couldn't get the scan tool software to work. Uh, but then I found out that you can reprogram the keys without a scan tool by locking and unlocking the car five times with the physical key in the driver's door. And this was where the eureka moment happened. When I went to unlock the driver's door, the key wouldn't fit. I sprayed WD-40 on it and on the lock, and nope, it was definitely not the right key. No wonder I was getting that error message, it's the wrong key. A little side story here, I went on Amazon, bought two key fobs, tried for almost an entire day to program them without any luck, it just failed, uh, before realizing that tons of other people on the Chevy Bolt forums had the exact same problem with aftermarket key fobs. So I spent about twice the amount of money, about $100 each for real legitimate OEM key fobs. While I was waiting on the key fobs to arrive, I was able to spend some time getting the scan tool software set up. I'm using a scan tool from VX Diag. It costs about $125 and comes with GDS2 software, which is the offline software for reading diagnostics codes and clearing them and configuring some modules and things. This is definitely a knockoff product and all of the software they give you is pirated and illegitimate. Uh, unfortunately, the real stuff costs like five times as much. If you want a more in-depth view into programming and stuff, I'll be highlighting it in a future episode. So throw a comment down below letting me know that you want to see it and subscribe to the channel to get updates. I strongly recommend if you're going to use VX Diag that you install it on a dedicated computer and do not give it access to anything on your network. In order to get it working right, you're required to completely disable Windows virus scans because if you don't, everything is detected as a virus and deleted automatically. But if you do that, it does work. And once I got through the issues with initial setup, uh, it works very reliably now. The other piece of software besides GDS2 is called SPS. This is a software subscription through AC Delco. It costs $40 to be able to program a single VIN for two years. That's a totally reasonable price in my view. SPS is used to completely reprogram modules in the car and is also used to reprogram the keys. At one point, once I got SPS working, I tried to reprogram the key that came with the car and I found out that as soon as you start the process, the car would go into service mode. This was a really big moment. I clicked the button to reprogram the key and all of a sudden, everything turned on at once. The windshield wipers were going, I could roll the windows up and down, the brake lights came on, I could even charge the car. It was great. But I still couldn't put the car into drive because you can't do that in service mode. But it told me something, which was that most likely the last thing I had to fix was the key. The other thing I could do was quit out of the SPS program while the car was in service mode, load up GDS2, and then access a bunch of modules that were previously not responding. Normally, scanning and clearing codes only works when the car is in on or in service mode because when the car is off, a lot of the modules aren't on, they're not active. This let me clear some more DTCs and it let me check if the high voltage DTCs within the battery pack were set, and they weren't. So then maybe two days go by and the OEM keys arrive. It was a 30 minute job to reprogram them. It worked the first try and the car would go into on mode. I could shift into drive and move the car forward, shift into reverse and move the car backwards. The backup camera worked. I could shift into neutral, disable the parking brake. The AC worked and it blew cold air. Even the brake lights that were just totally smashed up worked. This was an amazing moment because up until then, I was really worried. 
It cost me about $400 for the scanner, keys, and airbag resistors, and less than a week to get this $13,000 paperweight back to running and driving condition. I'm now 100% confident that everything that I need for the DeLorean EV conversion is good and working. This is a huge weight off my shoulders. That would have been a lot of money to spend to then find out that something was wrong with the battery or motor or transmission. Let's talk about hindsight now. Firstly, the error message I was getting about the key not being found. That message means that the immobilizer has been activated in the car, and that prevents most of the systems from turning on, which makes sense. If anybody could jump in your car without a key and hold down the power button for five seconds and get into service mode, it would be a huge security flaw. So it's really likely that the car might have worked right away if they had the right key. None of the trouble codes that had fired would have prevented it from starting since it was turned off when it was hit. The second thing, I spent a lot of time repairing the cut wires and things to the radio module that talks to the key fob. And that was probably not necessary to get the car to turn on. It turns out that there is a little spot where you can put the key in the center console. And when it's in there, the car can communicate with it directly like an RFID tag, and it doesn't go through the radio module at all. I didn't know that. Uh, I need that system to function anyway, so I can use the key fob to unlock and lock the DeLorean. So it wasn't a waste of time, but it wasn't strictly necessary for me to do it when I did. Um, that is actually where you put the key to reprogram it. That's all for now. Thank you so much for watching to the end. If you think this seems like a fun project, you won't want to miss out on the next episode where I take this running and mostly driving car and make it actually drive. And I'll get the rest of those codes fixed. Please show me you're interested and give me your support by subscribing. This is Project Lightning. Thank <laughs> you.